you know, energy and everything else is complex on Hawaii Island. Okay, we have today Senator Laura Ocasio. Uh, she's from District 1 in Hilo uh, in the Hawaii State Senate. This is Think Tech, and we're talking about uh, the cutting edge. Uh, and, and today we're going to have the cutting edge on a number of issues. But the first thing I, I want to clarify that this is not AOC. She's not in Congress. She's in the Hawaii State Senate, and she is not running for president. Am I got that right so far, Laura? So far, so good, Jay. Thank you for having me. Let's not foreclose the possibility at a later time, though, if you don't mind. Right. So you got to be a senator because David E.A. decided you were the right person uh, for uh, Hawaii Island. Why did he think you were the right person? Um, okay, so uh, it was a, it definitely a process. Seven people put their names in for this position to fill Kai Kahele's um, vacancy as he went to Congress and um, was a wonderful opportunity. Um, I have been part of the Democratic Party and working at the local level and also the state level with the state central committee for seven years at this point. Um, and, you know, I, I felt like here's an opportunity to utilize my skills, both as a collaborator, um, you know, reaching different groups within our community uh, and, a, and an educator. Um, so all of these tools and values and my, my knowledge of not only the the, the system of government, but also in our community and the, the, also the, the community work that I've done and leadership roles that I've played. I think he really saw that and thought that it would be a refreshing um, and energizing um, uh, addition to the state legislature, especially in the Senate. And how did you feel about it? Did you feel a certain amount of trepidation? And, uh, and if you did in the beginning, do you feel it more or less now? Um, I would say it was a little bit like riding a tidal wave. Um, Governor Egan and I discussed that in our interview as one of the things that I recognized um, that my learning curve would be huge, um, but that I was up for the task. And it felt in some ways, maybe like skipping law school and, and go straight to lawmaking. And yet at the same time, I knew that I have um, the background, the education, the, the history to, to serve my community well and to do the late nights and, and all of the reading that it takes to, to really do the due diligence that it takes in, in reaching out. Also, I think one of the things is being connected to different groups and different folks in our community um, and statewide is really important because legislators are expected in some ways to know everything, but the reality is we don't, but we really need to, like anything, you need to know where to find it. You need to know how to research it or, or who to call to get, um, different perspectives. And I think one of the pieces that, that Governor Ige may have seen in that is that I, I genuinely love civic discourse. And even though I do come with my opinions and my personal background that brings me to my own conclusions, I think what he saw was, I, I understand that we need to look at it from a broad range. And, and when we're figuring out all the, the nuances of what makes a good law and in lawmaking, we have to be able to hear other perspectives. We have to be able to bridge those things and we have to be able to find, okay, well, so in, you know, one, one perspective might be, this is the solution. And we, we agree on the problem, but maybe the solution is, is different. And so as a problem solver and as a teacher, I look at it in, in a comprehensive way where, okay, we have this issue, we agree on the issue, um, where are the problematic pieces in the differing solutions? And in that way, we can come to compromise. We could um, see different perspectives and open our own minds. Um, so I think that's, that's a big component. Um, trepidation, at this point, I feel like I have, the more I learn, the more there is to learn. And that excites me because my true intention in being in this position is to bring a level of community-based civic leadership as opposed to a pay-to-play, peer-based politics. And I think that our community is really hungry for that. We've been losing civic hope and civic faith and civic engagement for many, many years because of these kinds of things. And, um, and I do bring hope to that because I really think that the more that we see ourselves in our lawmakers, the more we want to get engaged. And 
And the opposite is true. And I think the opposite has been happening, um, especially when you, you add in the pieces of, of some of our colleagues, unfortunately, being uh, indicted this past year uh, because of decisions that they've made. And it may not be the end of that, unfortunately. And we, I think we as a community are frankly tired of that. And so here's an opportunity to jump into a place where um, you know, that fresh energy is not entrenched in some of the old baggage. Granted, I really do believe that institutional knowledge in this environment is very also important and it's important to have mentors, but I think the biggest piece to that is to have mentors that have ethics and, um, and an approach to civics that is truly egalitarian and really what democracy is, is built on, which is representation for the people by the people. So yeah, New York, in New York, where I'm admitted, uh, there's a big you know, courthouse down in Foley Square in Manhattan, and it's the uh, Supreme Court of New York. In that case, it's sort of like the circuit court here. It's not the Supreme Court of the state, but uh, like the circuit court. And there's a big uh, inscription over the doorway, as these courthouses always have some kind of inscription. And this inscription is really important. What it says is the firmest pillar of justice is, is public confidence. And when you have corruption revealed, you have prosecutions and investigations and FBI, and U.S. attorneys, what have you, prosecutors, um, that affect public confidence. And uh, it's our job, all of us, uh, especially, uh, you know, people in public office, but also the media uh, to examine it from that point of view and to share the points on which people can have public confidence. So rebuilding public confidence is really job number one in protecting the democracy, don't you think? Absolutely. I couldn't have said it better. Absolutely. And I think that is the biggest reason that drives me to continue this work. Um, there are many things I love about this job. Um, the opportunities for incredible um, innovation and um, really guiding those principles that you speak of and, and living that. And I think part of that, again, is because I'm not, I haven't been involved um, on a level where the money has been so, such a driving force to, to maintaining this position. Um, and so, you know, Governor Ige, actually, I really owe him a huge uh, mahalo, you know, in doing his due diligence and choosing because he really um, gave myself, but also our community an opportunity to, to have this as an example. Um, and I'm not the only one that believes this. Um, there are many colleagues that I work with that um, also uphold these values and, and have been doing it for many, many years. Um, but I think what does happen is there is a, I've been, uh, I've learned of a somewhat of a complacency when leadership has such a hold on uh, how folks act within the Senate that sometimes there is a little bit of complacency. Folks don't wanna be that one fringe person, but when you have a few other people um, there, it, you know, it kind of spreads out the, the, um, the focus. Oh, you bet. So, so yeah. um, you know, I was gonna ask you whether you consider yourself a reformer. Uh, and that's a hard question. It's a hard answer too. But I think I know the answer. What do you think the answer is? Um, I think I'm just doing what uh, most of our constituents would want me to do. So I don't know if that's reform uh, or or not. Uh, I think that I'm coming to it with really believing that my due diligence is to read all the bills. And one of the first things I've shared this um, shared this on the HSPA interview uh, recently, and Unfortunately, one of the biggest rules of grooming that I learned in the first two weeks of being in the Senate is don't read the bills. And of course, for me coming into it, that was incredibly shocking. Um, don't read the bills. That tells me right away, read every single word and read it carefully and critical thinking, because that's, that's my job. And that is the due diligence that my community would want. That's what I would want. Um, and so instead of just taking clues, you know, you know, you'll get invited to the right parties, you'll be a chair, you'll have an easy election, all of these kinds of things if you just don't read the bills and take the clues and follow <laughs> along. And I wouldn't call myself a reformer. And I also don't wouldn't say that that's um, outrageous because, Jay, would you want me to read the bills? 
yes. or would you want me to go along? Right. No. So that's not. Really yeah, you, we don't want surprises in the final copy, you know. <laughs> so you know, there's there's always discussion about a few things in the ledge uh, that are worth mentioning now, and there there are systemic things. You know, one for example is the chair of these committees. All the committees seem to have the chair seems to have uh, you know absolute power. Everybody goes along with the chair, and uh, about as much as you can do to express yourself is vote with reservation, which is. There was an article recently, I, I forget where it was, Civil Beat says, what does that mean? What's the reservation? Give me a break, you know? Um, what, how do you feel about the power of the chair in these committees? Um, first of all, I love that article. It was exactly what I had been speaking with with my staff and um, some colleagues all of the first session that I was in. Uh, because yes, with reservations is fundamentally flawed and many states don't even have it it really is a way to compromise and try to look one way or the other. And there was a really important bill before us within the first few weeks of, of me being in the, in the Senate. And I had um, you know, some colleagues coming in lobbying in my office and they just really wanted me to vote yes with reservations. And you know, that, so when that article came out, it was, it was quite funny because yeah, no, it's either yes or no, well, fundamentally. Um, if we get to a process where we can fix the bills before they get passed, and those reservations are authentically dealt with in the hearing process, again, civic discourse, right? Appropriate testimony, um, an appropriate amount of time for it, not trying to rush through 3,000 bills. Um, you know, that's one thing. Oh, my, 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 my interest, my concern is, uh, you know, there are some things in the legislature that do not give the public confidence. And oh, and one one of them is um, you know is this thing about um, you know that article and uh, you know with reservations. I mean, at the very least, uh, somebody ought to say, "Will you please tell us what your reservations are?" How about being explicit? Uh, I remember one time it was a confirmation of an appointee and the chair of the committee. I won't mention names. Uh, I asked them, uh, "Why are you you know dishing this this particular uh, nominee?" He says, "I just don't." feel right about her. What? You don't feel right? Well, have an aspirin, man. Maybe it's a stomach problem. You know, um, what, have you been eating correctly? Anyway, I mean, that you know, we need the transparency, don't you think? Yeah, so exactly what you said about the unilateral control of the chair, that is extremely problematic. And we could actually fix that within Senate rules already, so long as leadership, again, was open to uh, a much more um, fair playing field. Here's another interesting piece too, is that one of the practices that gets used on a regular basis um, that I see as problematic, again, coming in with fresh eyes and learning it from scratch is that so many bills get attached with a bad date or what they call an effective, a defective effective date. And that automatically sends it to conference committee as, and, and the idea within legislation is, or the legislature is that that will get whatever we don't agree with or whatever needs to be figured out will get figured out in conference committee. But uh, you ask many people and that conference committee is behind closed doors. The discussions are not public. Um, they generally even happen between just the chairs, not even the members on the committee and or even leadership, not even the chairs. The chairs are just there to deliver the, the last minute decision making or it gets killed behind closed doors. So it's often seen as the place where good bills go to die. And so that again, that becomes very problematic because we have lots and lots of bills and then advocates afterward or even during the process are calling our offices asking what's happening and why. And everyone kind of goes, I don't know. But again, because that goes back to the sunshine law, which when the legislature passed the sunshine law, they exempted themselves. So there is no sunshine. And honestly, um, I wrote this in my question and answer in my civil beat article uh, responses is that that feels like I'm doing a huge disservice to my community because here we are making decisions behind closed doors and for good or for bad, I'm in those conversations. So I hear what is being said and you can see who uh, perhaps is lobbying to kill or support a bill. And yet the public doesn't get to know that. And mm -hmm. so back to your point about public trust and 
And if we're to rebuild that public trust, the way to do it is to be 100% transparent, to, um, to create systems within the legislature rules that we can do without legislation um, that says, for example, there's some kind of fair exchange in terms of who becomes a chair rather than just being a chair for forever or you know, for 15 years. Yeah, again, that unilateral control says that that person, that senator's uh, constituents are have more representation than a senator that doesn't have a chairship because, you know, because of that power level. And we can also not use that effective defective date to the to the extent, or we can put rules on it. Another way to do it that creates more transparency is to say that if so many legislators sign on to a bill, that it automatically gets a at least a hearing. Um, you know, so that's a little bit more building the public trust. It at least allows the public to, to give feedback and to weigh in on an issue that otherwise maybe the chair is like, yeah, it gets introduced every year for 15 years, but never gets a hearing, right? But if the community really wants to hear this bill and it's a really important thing that needs to be addressed, you know, if you have enough senators that sign on, for example, it should automatically get a hearing. So there's some some little things we can we can do. Oh, you bet. That sounds like great stuff. I hope that can happen. Yeah. I mean, and, yeah. and you know, the whole thing about the conference committee is troubling. You know, Supreme Court made some you know profound statements in dealing with gut and replace, and good for them. But it's 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 not the end of the ball game, uh, because what you describe about the uh, you know it, the uh, ineffective correct ineffective effective date, uh, whatever it is, the um, is is another way to do gut and replace, isn't it? Because you know, material parts of the bill are left for secret discussion. This isn't so good. So I'm 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 happy to hear you say those things. But let me ask you this, Laura. Are, are you how do you feel about speaking truth to power? Um, because that's a big issue nationally. And I and I forgive me, but I conflate national issues with local issues. I think we have to be observant about what's going on in the main. We have to learn from it, uh, and we have to you know appreciate the same the same kind of steps to preserve the democracy. Um, so how do you feel about speaking truth to power? Um, I think it's incredibly important. It's inc incredibly powerful. Here's the thing. As a senator, you have power. So it's incredibly important to continue to speak truth. Let me ask you to take a minute and, and pitch yourself. Why should they vote for you in this primary coming up? Um, okay, again, it goes back to being energetic, uh, fresh eyes. Uh, that speaking um, to wanting to change the civic discourse and, and the practices that we have that allow corruption to fester within our, um, within our legislature. And I do have the energy. I care about Hilo incredibly. And, you know, again, going back to the connections and the, the, the ability and my experience over the past 25 years here as a resident in, in Hawaii, um, 20 years here in Hilo, I am very well connected in this community and have been giving a lot and want to continue to be of service. Um, so many folks have told me that there, it is time for change and that, you know, some of the folks that I'm running against have been operating um, for many, many years and they've had, they've had time and they've had chances. And I think they also see the bigger picture of how this particular race has the potential to really restructure and reorganize Senate leadership. Um, and for those people who follow Senate leadership and would like to see a reorganization, I think then they would also support that as well. Because um, immediately we have three uh, chairs who have retired, so we'll have to replace those chairs. And then if I win, we'll need to have a new water and land chair because um, you know Senator Lorraine Inouye is the water and land chair. Um, and then also we vote Coming up this session, we vote on who the president is and then who ultimately that all the chairships get decided as part of that reorganization process. And so here we have um, one of the old guard and, and establishment Democrats who have been in there for a really long time and is known to be part of this, um, this network of leadership within the Senate. And so here's an incredible opportunity to shift that. Um, and not only me, but there's other races as well within the the House that represent something very similar, uh, but also other races within the Senate that may be deciding factors on that reorganization.
So it's, it's very exciting times because we have the opportunity to shift uh, what we've been doing. And, and fundamentally, if we keep voting the same people in, we're going to have the same result. And so that's just basically goes down to, you know, the definition of insanity. And I also think that uh, <laughs> Albert Einstein brought it up in a very similar way. If you keep doing the same thing, you're going to get the same result. And so here's a wonderful opportunity to do something different. And um, I'm really excited about it. Yeah, I agree with you 1000%, Laura. So uh, drilling down on some specific issues, if you don't mind. Number one is, uh, and it, it, you know, it, your comments uh, evoked this question in me. Um, what do you think about term limits in the ledge? So term limits do have a really good potential. Um, I, I introduced a bill for term limits my first session um, out of the gate. And because I think it's an opportunity to flush the system of these um, grudges that get had. I've seen, and this was in my civil beat questionnaire as well, I've seen um, far too many times in a short period of time in two sessions where bills get killed because of grudges or, or money doesn't get delivered to certain um, communities because of grudges. And this can even happen with people of the same that are representing the same community. And so there's, that's a way to flush that out. Um, I've been recently exposed to different thoughts around how we can naturally do term limits rather than actually put a term limit, which is campaign finance reform. You know, because it will even out a lot of the playing field and, and put other rules in place that we've been discussing in the legislature, like making sure that legislators can't um, have fundraisers or even raise funds during the legislative session, really just to address the appearance of impropriety and, and dishonesty. But also what it does is it, it allows others who are working on campaigns on the side to get a leg up a little bit and get out in the community and that ultimately the work that we're doing as legislators should be speaking for itself. Um, and so, you know, here's, here's an opportunity to, um, you know, if we have a candidate who's an incumbent who has already almost a million dollars in their campaign account, or in the case that I'm running against what they already had, maybe 127,000, you know, that's a huge difference in terms of what kind of advertising and outreach and, and hiring potential for campaign consultants, for example, that they could do. And so, again, that would create maybe a, if we if we put caps on that or mandate public financing, put caps on how much they could roll over to the next session, I mean, next campaign or, you know, things like that, we could really address some of these term limits by really just it, it that will naturally help it turn over because another big piece to that is really engaging civics and teaching our community how to engage and why it's important. And really, again, if we build that trust back, people will engage. And so that's, and then it's our community that votes us in. And so that will, again, create a little bit more of a natural term limit because you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing in your community, hopefully to get you out. Okay, all right. It sounds great to me. I mean, I, let, me, let me add, you know, that I love candidates who answer the questions I pose. I really do. Thank, thank you for that. Um, but let's let's talk about some specific issues. You know, um, you're in agriculture and environment. Uh, Senate agriculture and environment is really, really, really important in terms of sustainability and resilience in the case of extreme weather, what have you, from climate change and all manner of, of risks and threats. Uh, what are we doing? Are we doing enough about agriculture? Uh, Glenn Wakai got up in a movie we made recently. He said only one percent of the state budget is dedicated to, um, you know, incentivizing agriculture, and that's not enough. Um, do you agree? Um, what can we do? I absolutely agree. We need to, we need to increase our, our procurement, state procurement of, of purchasing food so that we can help support our local farmers. We need to create uh, tax incentives. Some of the things that I have learned in my community that local farmers really need, especially um, smaller scale and ones that are are gearing their production for food security and, and feeding local people as opposed to for export is that what's really important is small, the ability to put small farm dwellings on agriculture land, you know, to live on site and so that they, they're not necessarily having to pay a mortgage somewhere else and then go and operate and work. And then I think that also addresses a lot of, the, could address a lot of the theft issues that we have here in rural community. 
which is a real problem. Um, and I think there are solutions that are that we need to look at beyond just continuing to over criminalize it, um, although it definitely needs to be addressed. And I know that there are frustrations um, for the people that are experiencing the theft um, and they just want it to end. Um, so, but the farm dwellings could help with that. Uh, another piece is that shared, um, the ability to have shared uh, equipment is really important. I was just speaking with a farmer yesterday who you know, could really use a chipper, but they don't need a chipper 24 seven. So they really would like to be able to you know, trade that around with folks and have some kind of maybe like a tool library uh, farmers tool library that they can use. Another piece is um, hubs or you know washing and storage kind of facilities, but including a certified kitchen because it's so cumbersome and it's so expensive and costly to uh, have certified kitchen. But if there's a uh, an ability to share it amongst the cooperative, and so we have something we have the Ulo Co-op here who is who's an incredible example of that, and we would just like to help. Um, continue to replicate that in various ways in our community, but I absolutely think we need to support it 100% and in all ways that we can. Turning to um, energy for a moment, there's so many questions. We could go on for hours, and I know I, I would have a, a wonderful time with you on these issues, but uh, energy, okay, we have a bunch of energy questions uh, affecting uh, Hawaii Island. Um, you know, one of them, of course, uh, is uh, geothermal down there in Puna, which is still, after all these years, uh, somewhat controversial. I do not understand that myself. Um, you know, another is, um, well, you know, energy in general. What are we going to do to make, uh, A, make, make more renewables in the Big Island, and B, make it cheaper because the Big Island's too expensive? Um, can you speak about that? I, I know you're not on the energy committee, but I know you care. Yeah, yeah. So, and and who knows what will happen after this election? Maybe I will be on the energy committee because yeah. we will have a uh, different distribution of our our chairs um, and our our committees. But um, so geothermal. What I do know is that there is a, a pretty um, uh, there's an ongoing discussion right now with folks in the in the the state around um, increasing geothermal. And I've been at a lot of the meetings because I think it's important for me to be present and to continue to understand where they're coming from as other issues may or may not come up. But what my understanding is that the geothermal in Puna is because it's on the East Rift zone, it's very volatile. It's at the, the hottest and most volatile point it could be at. And also therefore it has a lot of, um, it's, it's very toxic, a lot of metals, a lot of gases and, and things. So, so then it has more repercussions potentially for the, the community surrounding. And in that whole process of how geothermal came to be in the first place, there was a lot of trauma for the community on many levels, um, partly how it was done and then partly because I think at some point, my understanding is that they were, there was a, uh, there were uh, guidelines and things that weren't set up. And that at some point because of protests and because of, um, constantly monitoring the process, folks were able to get those safety, some of those safety pieces in place and some of those guidelines. And so the conversation now still carries over some of that trauma. I know a lot of people hear geothermal and it's an automatic trigger rather than learning that, that oh, there's other places that are potentially less volatile. It doesn't have that, doesn't carry that same thing or other, again, sometimes because of this distrust over time, you know, it does create a trigger where nothing is, you know, oh, you're going to just ram it through. And if, if, if things are done in a proper way, where there's all the stakeholders, there are right holders at the table and part of, in, in part of the, all of the beginning discussions and multiple right holders, uh, not just, you know, not just coming from one angle where folks can, again, really have this important civic discourse to see where we're going with our energy future. Um, I know Hawaii Island has, at least I, I believe it's about 45% reliance on geothermal at this point. And I think that's unique across the islands. Um, and so we're in a different position, presumably than you know, so a place like um, Oahu who has much more reliance on fossil fuels, even though we also rely on fossil fuels. Yeah, well, and, we're getting um, off coal on September 1st. 
So yeah. and that, that's going to be a big day. We're going to have a show about that with Hawaiian Electric later this week. Let me let me shift gears a little on energy, Laura. Um, you know, Marco Mangelsdorf would want me to ask you about who holds uh, because it's been so controversial. It's been bouncing around from court to court and agency to agency for years. Um, and um, you know, uh, I I saw I have never seen such a controversy on any particular project in my life. Um, so, query, how do you feel about that? Should we be using uh, biomaterial, you know, trees and all that? to create um, energy in the Big Island? Um, well, basically there's, like you said, there's a lot of controversy with that one. And um, I think my understanding is that right now it's been, uh, it's in the Supreme Court's hands and that we're waiting for um, an initial judgment, whether it's to deny the appeal or to um, accept the, um, the briefs based on the PUC um, proceedings or potentially um, even open up new oral argument um, on top of the PUC, you know, the PUC brief. And so um, waiting to hear that is kind of in limbo because as you said, it's going, been going back and forth for many years. I, I don't really see it ending because uh, my understanding is that Kuhonua um, is um, backed by Franklin Templeton, which has very deep pockets. and. I'm not exactly sure their larger picture motives, but we definitely have a lot of people in the community who um, are very concerned about the safety for their health, um, for our community, and also for the environment. And a lot of that is based on, and, and, and then also fundamentally, they're very concerned about a higher cost because um, my understanding is that they're trying with the PUC is that they, are asking for an exemption to the competitive bidding process, but that puts them up toward 22 cents uh, per kilowatt versus you know something like eight or nine cents with solar, and so that would be um, a burden for um, consumers to to bear, and so that's problematic. On the flip side, we also have people in the community who are who speak to their jobs. Um, I'm not exactly sure the number, but I want to say it's under 40. Um, I could be wrong on that one, but that it's a big concern. And so um, if we can see um, avenues for other jobs that are just as lucrative for folks, then of course, it makes 100% sense that they are concerned about putting food on the table and making sure that they can pay their bills. Um, so as far as burning trees, we have, again, we have issues with potentially the NPDES permit um, because, and, you know, it's so close to the shoreline and they are having these 800 foot injection wells. There's questions around whether the studies are, um, whether there are baseline studies for that, those injection wells. Also the concern around the use of water. Statewide, are, we are very acutely um, focused on the preservation of our fresh water and our aquifers, as we see with Red Hill in um, on and, and the problems that it could potentially pose in terms of uh, contamination. And so many have concerns twofold around the water. One is that it's over 21 million gallons per day being used to burn trees to power our, our things. And secondly, that the injection wells, or will, the water being injected has chemicals and it's quite close to the, the aquifer or has potential to impact and poison the aquifer. And so that's a big concern. And I think what the community is not confident in is A, that communication is honest, and B, that the studies, the proper studies have been done in order to reassure that, you know, these things are, are taken care of in protecting the health and safety. And that's only some of it. The fossil fuels that will go into cutting the trees, transporting the trees, creating new roads. We still have bridges that need to be fixed. All this past year, Mamma School's bus had to go around Saddle Road and the kids were arriving at school at nine o'clock because our bridges can't handle over 12 tons. And so these are really fundamental infrastructure things that will need to be uh, remedied and, and or discussed before we can go forward anyway. And that, that's kind of separate even from the initial uh, you know, discussions with the Supreme Court of, of whether this is carbon neutral and whether it makes any sense to be burning trees or burning anything for that matter to create 
um, especially burning stored carbon to be creating electricity. Yeah. Referring back to the early part of our conversation, Laura, you know what, what one thing you mentioned which troubles me is the notion that somebody on the mainland with a deep pocket can affect policy here in Hawaii, regardless of what anyone in Hawaii says, regardless of what the courts say or the commissions or the boards. And, um, you know, it's like there's been plenty of news in the paper around the, this election that's happening right now about PACs from the mainland uh, that are throwing money, including hit piece money, uh, at candidates. And, uh, you know, I, I think we all have a duty to resist that, um, don't you? Absolutely. Jay, you hit the nail right on the head. That's exactly it. Um, and that that comes back to our community autonomy and home rule and things like that. And I, I feel like what I hear in, in my community and especially my constituents is that they want to make sure that they have a representative that is taking their best interests in mind and listening to their voices and not necessarily uh, some you know grander scale thing and again, not necessarily insinuating that there's anything nefarious or, or illegal or unethical happening in that, that scenario, but just making sure that their voices are heard and that health, safety. I've had a, a, a constituent from Pepe Keo, well, she would be a constituent if I win, in Pepe Keo said that the first and foremost that she wants in her representative and her senator is that they absolutely stand up and protect health safety and environment. And mm -hmm. she's lived through, she, she said, born and raised on plantation um, in Pepe Ikeo, and she's seen it and she doesn't want to go back to it. She really believes that we need to be taking control of that. Amen. Choices. Amen to her and amen to you. Uh, we're, we're really out of time, but I want to ask you, I would be remiss not to ask you about one, you know, huge question, which has been, you know, which has been central in the converse, public conversation around the, about the Big Island for years and years. Actually, it's probably going on 20 years already, and that's TMT. Uh, and the sad story is that it's still in flux. We don't have an answer. We don't have any construction going on. We have all of these various um, you know, distractions, may I say. We have had 20 years of distraction. I'd like to know your position on TMT, Laura. Okay, I think it's actually very similar to the Huhonua answer where we have folks that are um, invested in Hawaii that are from elsewhere and they have a specific agenda. And I know a lot of folks who also live here support that agenda. And again, we have things like they don't have an MPBES permit. They're now going through this EIS process again with public scoping, which I would have to say it's really important to note that the original EIS was signed by Catherine Kealoha, who is now in federal prison. And so whether or not that def that doesn't necessarily um, invalidate or, or void the EIS, but it brings to question, again, this public trust um, and who's doing what for who and why, et cetera. Um, so the direct answer to your question is I'm very much um, not in support of building PMT. Uh, at this time or any time, and that I am uh, in support of a process that is very much legal and includes the voice of the community. All right. Uh, <clears throat> Laura Ocasio, uh, Senator Laura Ocasio, who is running in the primary, what, next, next week? Yep, Saturday. Next, Saturday? Okay, and uh, and uh, hopefully in uh, in November uh, for first district, first district, whatever shape it may be, <laughs> in the Big Island. Thank you so much, Laura. Really appreciate the discussion and uh, and having you on the show. I hope we can do this again. Ah, uh, thank you so much, Jay, for the opportunity. I appreciated it as well. Good Aloha. Fun.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.